and Newfeld people represented by Mr. Goldberg and uh, Mr. Darden. All right, Deputy McNair, let's have the jurors, please. As to what? As to what? Uh, on the matter, Mr. What matter? Um, does it have to do with Ms. Mazzola? No, it doesn't. No, no, I, I, All right, then I let's. Have, I have something that does have to do with Ms. Mazzola. <clears throat> my, my will take 60 seconds. 60 seconds, Mr. Cochran. But who's counting? Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, uh, at the <laughs> kidding, Your Honor. At the end of the day yesterday, and I, I brought this matter to your attention. I thought I should put it on the record. Uh, after our hearings in chambers, which were um, confidential uh, uh, hearings, um, Mr. Shapiro and I came out, and uh, we were out in the courtroom. We were just about to leave, and I had to go back into the, the hallway there. And um, something very disturbing uh, occurred, as far as I was concerned. As the court is aware, the commander, um, Holland, I guess his name is, of the Sheriff's Department, had said in all the interviews. And I then saw the district attorneys, the two district attorneys, going into the jury room to have a private meeting with, with the sheriff's uh, commander. Now, that's been our concern from the very beginning, that, that this man who's over all the sheriffs who sit with our jurors would impart special information to the DA's office. I don't know what they were talking about. They didn't invite us back there. And I indicated to the court my concern right yesterday afternoon when this meeting was going on we then left the court. But I think that it's certainly from an appearance standpoint, it's absolutely outrageous to, to have something like that happen, and it's unfortunate. And I wanted to doc document, it on the, document it on the record. I did bring it to the court's attention right away. And um, the, the meeting, I don't know how long the meeting went on, but it did in fact take place. And I think it's entirely inappropriate for the district attorneys to meet with the representative from the sheriff's department who are sitting with our jury. And it only uh, fans the, the flames. And I want to indicate that for the record, Your Honor. All right, thank, thank you, you Mr. Newfield. Your Honor, can Ms. Mazzola step out for one second, please? Certainly. Thank Ms. Mazzola. <laughs> Mr. Newfield. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, on January 20th, you issued an order um, instructing all, all, all fact witnesses in this case to refrain from watching any television or listen to any radio coverage about the trial and testimony having to do with uh, that in any way may pertain to the subject matter of their own testimony. As you may recall, when Ms. Mazzola testified on Thursday, she acknowledged that she had been listening to uh, the radio coverage of the case and testimony. And in fact, there was a radio even in the toxicology laboratory that was broadcasting the, uh, the trial live. Mm -hmm. uh, she also mentioned that there are other radios all over the SID laboratory uh, that are covering the trial live. In fact, there's a television in the uh, cafeteria the doing that as well. I heard the testimony. Um, and, you know, Your Honor, two things. One is I realize that your order creates an exception for experts. I don't believe that Ms. Mazzola is an expert. Um, for, first of all, um, she's a criminalist, one. I don't believe she would meet the criteria for an expert uh, as you envisioned it when you issued this order. Secondly, and more importantly, Your Honor, to the extent that she does give opinion testimony, as does, for instance, Detectives Lang and Van Adder as well can give opinion testimony, they are first and foremost fact witnesses in this case, as opposed to the classic example of an expert, which I'm sure the court had in mind. Your Honor, I think it's one thing if, if a neighbor, for instance, who testifies, who was walking What are you asking for? I'm asking for an instruction, Your Honor, to this jury um, that they should take into consideration the fact that apparently the prosecutors failed to uh, instruct these witnesses at SID not to listen to the coverage of the trial. I'm also worried, in a, in a broader sense, that every single witness, they have about six or seven people from SID who are going to be testifying who are fact witnesses. And apparently, uh, it is, the trial is being covered you know, live as we speak throughout the SID laboratory. And all the people are listening to it on a regular basis who will be coming into court and testifying. I think that clearly you know, violates both the letter and the spirit of your ruling. Um, I think it's completely different, Your Honor, if a civilian witness who comes in here happened to watch something on the television, listen to it on the radio. But when you have people who are actually under the control, or at least there's some possible direct control here by the district attorney's office, um, of the Los Angeles Police Department, and those people have either been, have not been admonished, uh -huh. or they've been admonished and ignored the admonition. Have you drafted a, uh, an instruction to the jury? No, but I can do so uh, during the luncheon break, Your Honor. Mr. Goldberg. Thank you. Your Honor, as I recall the court's order, and I, I read it, it did exempt expert witnesses. And the witnesses that we are calling are all expert witnesses. 
And we don't have a sliding scale for expertise where somehow people with PhDs are treated differently than people with bachelor's degrees. These are expert witnesses who are trained in crime scene processing. Other SID witnesses are expert witnesses who are trained in analysis and are going to be testifying as expert witnesses. If the court will recall the cross-examination on Mr. Fung, there are several things that I, that I bring up. Number one, he was given a, a, a lengthy a series of hypothetical questions. We don't allow those questions for anyone other than an expert witness. He was cross-examined about treatises that he's read. The issue is Ms. Mazzola, not Mr. Fung. Well, the, he focus just your, lumped... Focus your attention on Ms. Mazzola. Okay, but, but, but Your Honor, I, I'm, I don't distinguish between the two, and that, that's my point. I, I don't say that we have a sliding scale of expertise. She has gone to school. She has graduated. She has read textbooks on crime scene processing. She has been trained in crime scene processing. She is going to be asked to render certain opinions about what she did and the effects that it had, and so on. And, and what we are trying to decide is whether prospectively the prosecution had a duty to misinterpret the court's plain order that exempted expert witnesses. Reinterpret. And reinterpet. I think misinterpret. Because, uh, I mean, it seems like it's, it, it, you know, there's, there's a rule of statutory construction that unless there's some ambiguity in the language, you interpret it the way it's written. And, and that is what, what I did. But I, I just like to, to, uh, to try to look at this prospectively from the prosecution standpoint. What has happened with our SID witnesses? They have been asked about things that they did not witness. Mr. Fung was uh, examined extensively about a blanket that was placed upon Nicole's uh, body that occurred before he arrived at the crime scene. He was questioned about the movement of objects that occurred before he arrived at the crime scene. He was questioned about whether the location had been cleared for, for footprints before Mr. he Goldberg, arrived you, at the crime you have scene. To under, you have to assume that since I was here, I was probably listening to the testimony. Uh, I, I know, but I'm, I'm just trying to, to highlight the, the, the uh, significant points of it. And they were asked about coroner's activity. One of the ways that you can question an expert witness is by giving them a hypothetical. And another way, and it is a proper way, is to ask the witness, have you viewed the testimony? Have you listened to the testimony? And based upon what you have heard, what opinions did you render? That is an appropriate way of questioning an expert witness. It's not used as frequently as the hypothetical, but it is used. And if our witnesses are going to be questioned as they have about things that they didn't witness, didn't hear, it would be proper perhaps even advisable if we had instructed them, not only do I not want you to avoid this, but I want you to sit down and listen to every single witness who testified about anything regarding crime scene processing, because you are going to be questioned about it. You are going to be asked to render opinions about it and conclusions about it. So you should look at the crime scene photographs, videotapes, you should, you should uh, listen to all of the testimony, because you are being held accountable in the cross-examination for all of that material. And as an expert witness, you can be held accountable for it. And there is no basis upon which to distinguish between any of our scientists at SID. And uh, I think that that kind of an instruction would be entirely improper. But what I would ask the court to do, and I was thinking about this before Mr. Neufeld raised it, is to instruct the jury, since they don't know, that the court did issue an order that exempted expert witnesses. I was thinking the exact opposite of what Mr. Neufeld is, because they have been implying through their questioning Somehow that, doesn't surprise me. That, that, that there is something improper about what has happened here. And, and what immediately occurred to me is, well, wait a minute. The jury should know that there is an order that exempts expert witnesses, and we would be asking for an instruction to that effect. Have you drafted any such instruction? No, I haven't, Your Honor. But, but, uh, I, I, I will draft an instruction. And what I would propose to do probably would be simply to draft an instruction that's along the lines of the language that the court used in its order that says that we apply a different rule towards expert witnesses. And here was my order that I gave out to the prosecution and to the defense. All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. All right. The uh, court will decline at this time to uh, instruct the jury regarding this issue. The court's uh, order regarding expert witnesses does cover anybody from the Scientific Investigation Division. It's not reasonable to expect a court to go 
witness by witness as to whether or not they're an expert given this particular category of witnesses. Secondly, the uh, defense has the right to cross-examine as to what exposure Ms. Mazzola has had, uh, and that is fair game for cross-examination. <laughs> All right, let's have the jurors, please. Let's have Ms. Mazzola. of the week, what's your guesstimate at this point, time-wise? I think I'll be finished with this witness by lunch tomorrow. All right. Um, I'll give you a much better estimate at lunch. All right, let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Andrea Mazzola is on the witness stand, and she is undergoing cross-examination by Mr. Neufeld. Good morning, Ms. Mazzola. Good morning. You are reminded that you are still under oath. Mr. Neufeld, you may continue. Good morning, Ms. Mazzola. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Okay. Ms. Mazzola, since we uh, last saw each other on Thursday afternoon, have you had any uh, prep sessions with the prosecutors uh, since you left court that afternoon? Vegas prep sessions. I have. Talked with them a little bit, yes. Well, have you met with them at their offices? Yes. Okay. On, did you meet with them on Thursday after court? No. Meet with them on Friday? No. Meet with them on Saturday? No. Sunday? No. Yesterday? No. Okay. Um, when did you meet with them? This morning? Yes, this morning. This was the first time? I believe so, yes. Did you talk to them on the telephone over the, uh, during the break, during the four-day break? About this case? I think I did. You think you did? I think I did, yes. You're not sure? I don't remember. You don't remember speaking to uh, prosecutors on the phone about this case during the last four days? It One might or the other? It might have just been to tell me when to show up to court. I don't okay. remember. Now, Ms. Mazzola, when we were last in court on Thursday afternoon, you testified, I believe, that only after you arrived at Rockingham in the early morning hours and you listened to a discussion that uh, Dennis Fung was having with the detectives, that Dennis Fung told you that given the nature of the case, that he and not you would be the officer in charge. Is that correct? That's correct. And after he told you that he would become the officer in charge, the detectives then told you about the Ford Bronco for the first time. Is that right? I believe so. And the detectives took you and Fung over to see the Bronco. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's when they took you over to see the Bronco that you first began to fill out the vehicle search checklist. Isn't that right? That's correct. And notwithstanding, Ms. Mazzola, yours and Dennis Fung's testimony that upon arrival at Rockingham, um, that he announced that he would be the officer in charge, that on the vehicle search checklist, which you began to fill out, I'm sorry, withdrawing. Isn't it true, Ms. Mazzola, therefore, that even though you had been informed in advance of filling out the vehicle uh, search checklist that he would be the officer in charge, that you nonetheless put yourself down as the officer in charge on that vehicle search checklist? That's correct. Um, and, and by the way, the, the, that report, the vehicle search checklist, where you put yourself down as the officer in charge, um, that was done in pencil, was it not? Yes. And I believe that the reason that these field reports are filled out in pencil is so that if there are errors or omissions or mistakes, Excuse it can me, be... Excuse me, Mr. Newfeld. Deputies, there are people in the back row who are conversing next to the photographers. Would you eject them from the courtroom, please? Two individuals next to the photographers. Do you want me to sit for a second? No, go ahead. Proceed. <coughs> In fact, Ms. Bazzola, there are erasures in the original field notes, aren't there? And there could be, yes. Well, have you looked at the original field notes in this case at any time since June 13th? I think I had once or twice. Do you have the originals with you? There Mrs. Robertson?
Ms. Mazzola, didn't you testify, in fact, on direct examination that there were certain erasures on the, uh, on the field notes um, for the collection of items 18, 17, and 19? Didn't you just testify to that on Thursday? Yes. Okay. So it was not unexpected for you and Dennis Fung to make erasures to correct um, errors in the notes. Is that right? That's right. And that's correct, okay. yes. Yet, ma'am, no one erased your name as the OIC, the officer in charge on the vehicle search checklist. Isn't that correct? That's correct. You continue to have that title throughout. Title? Well, oh. that, that your title on that report was never changed. Isn't that right? That's correct. And that report was filled out even after Dennis Fung told you that he was going to be the officer in charge. Isn't that correct? Yes. Now, Ms. Mazzola, is it really the policy and practice of the Los Angeles Police Department SID unit to name a trainee the officer in charge on a murder case? I don't believe so. Okay. Then when they refer to you, ma'am, as the officer in charge, and you put your name down as the officer in charge on these uh, field note reports, is that some kind of game of make-believe that the LAPD wants you to play? Sustained. Ms. Mazzola, isn't the real reason that you testified on direct examination that a decision had been made to name Fung the OIC after you filled out the cover sheet for Rockingham was because it was necessary for you to support Dennis Fung's testimony, minimizing your involvement in this case. Sustained. Sustained on both counts. Had the prosecutors, before you took the witness stand in this case, Ms. Mazzola, told you that it was important for you to back up Dennis Fung's failure to mention you in the grand jury? No, they did not. Okay. Now, prior to June 13th, you had personally collected bloodstains in only two crime scenes, is that correct? Mm, I think that's correct, yes. And at both those two scenes, you were a trainee, isn't that right? I was a criminalist one. Well, Ms. Mazzola, you agreed, did you not, that you had testified on August 23rd that you were a trainee as of June 13th when you collected evidence in this case, isn't that correct? Whole I was on probation as a criminalist one. Ms. Mazzola, didn't you also testify on August 23rd and acknowledge that on June 13th you were still a trainee? Uh, that the testimony. Oh, ruled. Do you recall testifying to that, Ms. Mazzola? I honestly don't recall. All right, move on. And Ms. Mazzola, even at your first two crime scenes when you were on probation, the supervising criminalist didn't bother to stay with you the entire time. Isn't that right? That's correct. And even at your first two crime scenes, when you were on probation, there were times when you collected blood stains unassisted by a supervising criminalist. That's correct. Well, Ms. Mazzola, is it the policy and practice of the Los Angeles Police Department SID unit to deliberately leave a trainee alone, unsupervised, while collecting critical evidence in certain cases? Sustain. Is there a policy and practice of the LAPD that student or trainee, uh, I'm sorry, that probationer or criminalist participating in their very first crime scene collection uh, matter should be there in an unsupervised capacity when they're collecting critical evidence? Irrelevant, also, critical evidence. Overall. I do not know what their policy is. Well, have they ever expressed to you, ma'am, a desire to have you simply learn from your mistakes when handling important evidence at a murder crime scene? It's vague. Good phrase the question. Is there a policy and practice of the LAPD SID unit that new probationers like yourself learn from mistakes when you're collecting critical evidence at a murder crime scene? Vague argument. Overall. When you are trained on how to collect evidence, you don't make mistakes on how to pick it up. Ms. Mazzola, you're saying that um, it's impossible for you to make a mistake at a crime scene? 
I'm asking you a question. Hold. I collect the evidence the way I was trained. That's the only way I know how to do it. Ms. Mazzola, please answer my question. Are you saying that it is impossible for you to make mistakes when collecting evidence at a crime scene? <laughs> mistakes can happen. And mistakes do happen. Is that correct, Ms. Mazzola? Mistakes and mistakes. Oh, it's possible that they do. And is it also true, Ms. Mazzola, that you can inadvertently make a mistake at a crime scene and not at that moment be aware of it? Well, it's overruled. We're getting into speaking objections on both sides. I'm warning counsel at this time. Proceed. Would you please restate the question? No. He's going to ask another question. Oh, okay. Ask another question. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Was the objection overruled? Yes. Okay. Proceed. Okay. Ask it again. All right. <laughs> Ms. Mazzola, would you agree that inadvertent mistakes can be made by the criminalist at the scene, which may not be noticed at the time that the mistake is made? That is possible. So you really can't say, Ms. Mazzola, that you've never made any mistakes at the few crime scenes that you've participated in, can you? That's true. By the way, Ms. Mazzola, you mentioned on direct examination that at the first crime scene that you attended, that that team received a commendation. Is that right? That's correct. And how many items were collected by that team at that first crime scene? I don't remember. Well, at that first crime scene, your very first one, Ms. Mazzola, for which they received a... Newfell, I don't want to try that crime scene. Okay. Well, let me ask you this, Ms. Mazzola. Have you and Dennis finally received any commendation for your crime scene collection in this case? No, that's ruled. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. And in contrast to those first couple of crime scenes, Ms. Mazzola, where you were present, in this case, on June 13th of 1994, you were, in fact, the primary collector of bloodstains as opposed to Dennis Fong. Isn't that right? That's right. And the Simpson case was your very first case in which you were the primary collector of bloodstained evidence. Isn't that correct? Mm, that's correct. And you personally collected almost all the bloodstains in this case on June 13th. Isn't that right? Almost all. Overall. The majority, yes. To your knowledge, Ms. Mazzola, are there any written procedures of the Los Angeles Police Department limiting those crime scenes to which a probationer or trainee can participate in evidence collection? Irrelevant to To my best of my knowledge, I don't know if there is a policy or anything. To the best of your knowledge, are there any procedures which say that you should at first handle crimes less serious than murder? I do not know if there is a policy on that. To your knowledge, ma'am, does the Los Angeles Police Department publish any guidelines at all as to how to supervise and train a, a, a new criminalist at a crime scene? I don't know. You've never heard of any? I've never heard of any. Well, to your, to your knowledge, Ms. Mazzola, is each supervising criminalist free to allow you to do as much or as little as a particular su supervising criminalist chooses? I, I don't know. I'm not a supervising criminalist. I don't know what their guidelines are. Well, you said you'd been to two previous crime scenes. Correct. It would be fair to say that those other two crime scenes, by the way, the other two crime scenes, was Dennis Fung your supervisor? No. And at the other two crime scenes, when Dennis Fung was not your supervisor, you certainly were not the primary collector of bloodstain evidence, were you? It was a team effort. Ma'am, please answer my question. Were you or were you not the primary collective crime scene evidence of the other two crime scenes that you participated in? It was about 50-50. Ma'am, isn't it a fact that at the first two crime scenes that you participated in that you were not the primary collector of bloodstained evidence? Sustained. Counsel, I'm really not interested in the other crime scenes. <laughs> Ms. Mazzola, 
since you've been at the Los Angeles Police Department, are you aware of the LA Police Department's Crime Scene Field Unit Protocol and Procedures Manual? I'm not familiar with that, no. Well, has it ever been given to you to look at? No. Has anyone ever instructed you to read it? No. Have you received during the year and a half that you've been with the Los Angeles Police Department any manual prepared by SID laying out the various procedures and rules that you are required to follow? No. Is there any written manual, ma'am, that you rely on when you go out to process evidence at a crime scene? No. Is there any book distributed to you to instruct you on how to conduct crime scene investigation? No. Well, ma'am, without a textbook and without a manual, am I correct in assuming that your authority and your teacher on June 13th was exclusively Dennis Fung? Or will. We had been taught the procedures that SID wished us to follow. There was no written material given out as in the form of a manual or textbook. Well, on June 13th, there is no manual that you can refer to for assistance. Is that correct? That's correct. And on June 13th, there's no textbook that you can refer to to help you out on a certain matter of, of crime scene collection. Is that correct? That's correct. And so the only person or the only authority that you could turn to on June 13th when you were at the crime scene was Dennis Fung. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Now, one of the things you've been taught to do, uh, Ms. Mazzola, is to fill out and prepare uh, crime scene investigation field notes. Is that right? We have been shown the notes before, yes. And these crime scene checklists and field notes um, are a series of reports and forms that you're expected to accurately and completely fill out in connection with crime scene investigations. Isn't that correct? I was told to fill in the parts that were the most important. And were you told, ma'am, to fill out these reports and forms contemporaneously with the activities that you're engaged in? For the most part, yes. And were you taught, ma'am, in your Los Angeles Police Department, I think you said you, were, you attended the Mini Academy, is that right? Correct. Were you taught at the Los Angeles Police Department SID Mini Academy that it was important to fill out these forms accurately? Yes. And were you told when you were in the Mini Academy that it's impossible to remember the sequence of every event at a crime scene investigation and therefore it is essential to record uh, and fill out these reports? I don't remember. Well, is it true that between, when, what day did you first start with the Los Angeles Police Department, Ms. Mazzola? January 24th, 94. From January 24th, 1994, until you testified at a hearing on August 23rd, 1994, it was your understanding, based upon what you had been taught, that you were required to fill out these reports, these field notes, completely. Isn't that correct? I had watched the other criminalists in the field as they fill out theirs. And when you had watched the other criminalists in the field fill out theirs, they filled out these reports completely, did they not? Some did. Ms. Mazzola, isn't it a fact that it was your understanding when you testified on August 23rd that you were required to fill out these reports completely and accurately? I believe I testified something like that. Isn't it a fact, Ms. Mazzola, that it was only after you finished testifying on August 23rd and you had testified to this duty to fill, fill these reports out completely that when you then got back to the, uh, the LA Police Department SID lab that individuals for the first time said, no, 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 it's not necessary to fill them out completely. Isn't that what happened? 
As I said before, I had seen other criminalists fill out portions, some fill out the entire forms. Ms. Mazzola, I asked you, didn't you believe that up till August 23rd when you testified in this case, that is for the first seven or eight months of your employment, that you were required to fill out these reports completely? I believe so, yes. Not just to fill out portions, but to fill them out in totality. Isn't that right? Yes. And would it be fair to say, Ms. Mazzola, that when you're actually conducting the crime scene evidence collection on June 13th, you don't know in your own head what's going to be important to an investigator or to a prosecutor six months down the road. Isn't that a fair statement? Yes, it is. And isn't that another reason why they want you to write everything down so other people later on will be able to reconstruct what happened? Sustain. Phrase the question. Would you agree, Ms. Mazzola, that you can't anticipate during the actual crime scene collection phase which details will be important to the investigation six months hence? It's over. Oh, well. You've already asked that question. Okay. Ms. Mazzola, one of the requirements on these forms is to note for each item collected the location it is found. Is that right? It's not evidence, it's two yes. And another item on the form is time, the time each item is collected. Is that correct? That's correct. And another item that you are, that up until August 23rd, you believed you were required to fill out was by whom the item was collected. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And so, ma'am, if as recently as August 23rd, you believed you were required to fill out these reports completely, you also operated under that belief when you were present on June 13th and June 14th to participate in the crime scene investigation of Mr. Simpson's case. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Did you ever receive any handouts from your superiors at the Los Angeles Police Department informing you of the importance of keeping <coughs> accurate and complete records? I don't believe so. Did you ever receive a handout from your superiors at the Los Angeles Police Department entitled Quality Assurance and Quality Control? That doesn't sound familiar. Have you ever heard that term? I've heard the terms before, but not in the context that you're If speaking. I showed you a document, might it refresh your recollection? Maybe. May I, Your Honor? You may. read this to yourself, okay? okay. Ms. Mazzola, I ask you again, have you ever received a handout uh, from your superiors at the Los Angeles Police Department SID unit um, instructing you that you were required to keep complete and accurate field notes? That page does not look familiar to me. Okay. Well, separate department actually receiving a handout at some point at, the, at this mini academy did your instructors ever teach you that it was very important 
in terms of your professional responsibility to, to make accurate and complete field notes. Is that something that they taught you? I believe so. Okay. <coughs> and when you taught Ms. Mazzola that if swatches, for instance, were not properly marked, packaged, and identified, they could get mixed up. And that's correct. And were you taught that if items of evidence were not properly packaged and identified, it made it easy for someone to tamper with those items? That was never brought up. You were never received any instruction at all during your entire time at this mini academy on taking measures to avoid evidence tampering? No one would tamper with the evidence. That's an assumption you're making, is it not, Ms. Mazzola? Uh, that's an argumentative sustain. Well, Ms. Mazzola, you can certainly speak for yourself, is that correct? Uh, that's argument. I can speak for myself, and I know the people I work with. And you're saying, Ms. Mazzola, that there's nobody who you've ever met, who you know, at the Los Angeles Police Department who would ever tamper with evidence, is that right? The people I know wouldn't. And, Ms. Mazzola, you also said it was your impression that you've never made a mistake at all in the handling of crime scene evidence. Is that correct? Sustained. Ms. Mazzola, would the people that you work with at the SID ever make a mistake in the handling of crime scene evidence? Sustained. Well, Ms. Mazzola, you said a moment ago that you had been taught to keep accurate and complete field notes during the training. See counsel at the sidebar, please. With the court report. Ms. Mazzola, would you agree that at least on June 13th, in these notes, Dennis Fung did not keep complete field notes? That is a new question. You can answer that question. Yes. Well, when you got back to the laboratory, either on June 13th or on June 14th, did you tell Dennis Fung that he hadn't kept complete and accurate field notes for June 13th? Oh, well. I didn't tell Mr. Fung anything like that. Did you go to either Ms. Kessler, the head of the laboratory, did you go to her and tell her that the person you were working with that day did not comply with the requirement as you believed at that time, that is to keep complete field notes? No. Did you go to Mr. Matheson, the number two person, and tell him that your teammate had failed to follow the requirement of keeping complete field notes? Sustain. Did you tell anybody about this? No. Move on. Ms. Mazzola, you said that after August 23rd, you were told that you do not have to fill out all the boxes and columns on these field reports. Is that correct? Uh, 
I'm moving, it's foundation. I'm moving into into a new subject. Your Honor, yes. She's already been asked and answered that question, Council. Oh. Uh, who taught you that some of these boxes and some of these columns do not have to be filled out, Ms. Mazzola? I had just talked to some of the other criminalists. Which criminalist, Ms. Mazzola, told you that you don't have to fill out every box and every column on these field notes? What are their names? That's irrelevant, counsel. If that's what she testified to, that's the fact she's testifying to. Who told her? Doesn't matter. Let's proceed. Who were these supervisors? They were more experienced criminalists. Were they supervisors in the laboratory like Mr. Matheson and Ms. Kessler? Oh, rule. No. They didn't tell you that, did they? No. And Ms. Mazzola, you were taught by Mr. Matheson and Ms. Kessler that these reports specifically were prepared to be filled out by criminalists at the scene. Isn't that correct? No. Well, Ms. Mazzola, you, you said, and I quote, that some boxes don't apply to the criminalist at the scene. Let's start with the box that says collected by, Ms. Mazzola. Is it your testimony that the box where they're asking you to write down who it is who collected each item doesn't apply to the criminalist at the scene? Yes or no? As of June 13th, I was informed we were working as a team. The box was not necessary to be filled out. Ms. Mazzola, the first time you were told that was August 23rd, that you didn't have to fill out all these boxes. Isn't that correct? No, it was June 13th. Ms. Mazzola, isn't it relevant to know who collected the item of evidence for purposes of establishing a chain of custody? Were you taught that? Not to really establish the chain of custody. Well, Ms. Mazzola, were you taught anything about chain of custody in your training? Silver fraud. Yes. And were you taught that the first thing one has to do in establishing a chain of custody is establish who the person is who actually collected the item of evidence? Or will. Weren't you taught that? I don't believe so. Well, Ms. Mazzola, let's go on to the ID markings. There's a column on here that says ID mark. Is that right? Yes. And the mark stands for identification markings. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Well, weren't you taught that what this column is for is for you to know what markings you put on a particular item of evidence so it can be identified at a later time as being a particular item that you collected? Weren't you taught that? No. Were you ever taught anything with respect to the purpose of the column on your field note report that says ID mark. I don't remember. Don't remember being taught that at all? I might have been taught, I don't remember. And Ms. Mazzola, on the crime scene checklist, there is a box, a question that says, has the scene been altered? If so, by whom and how? Isn't there? Yes. And in fact, there is four lines that follow that, that question. Isn't that right? I don't know the exact number of lines. Well, they leave you space so you can answer those questions, don't they? Yes. And you would agree, ma'am, that that's a very important question, isn't it? Space oh. Yes. Well, isn't it relevant to the overall investigation to know whether a crime scene has been altered? Yes. In fact, ma'am, if a crime scene has been altered, it could render subsequent scientific analysis unreliable, couldn't it? I don't have the experience to answer that. Well, ma'am, for instance, if, if a blanket, for instance, okay, was used to alter the crime scene and it left trace evidence where there had none been previously, that could render an analysis of certain trace evidence unreliable, couldn't it? It's possible. All right. And that's why the Los Angeles Police Department Scientific Investigation Division 
has asked you to fill out this question, has a scene been altered? And if so, by whom and how? Isn't that right? Yes. And they taught you in the SID Mini Academy that it's important to know who altered it and how it was altered so you would know whether or not subsequent analysis is worthless. Isn't that right? No. Well, wouldn't you want to know the extent to which a crime scene had been altered in understanding the value of evidence obtained at that crime scene? That's the last rule. For the most part, you can look at the evidence and sort of tell if it has been trampled through. Um, people at the scene when they first arrive are extremely careful of what they touch, where they step, because of the fact that there is evidence present. Ms. Mazzola, when you arrived at the Bundy crime scene, how many people were there inside the tape, approximately? I don't know. Well, it was more than a dozen, wasn't there? I don't know. Well, there were several detectives? It's vague. Was there more than one detective inside the crime scene? It's possible. You don't remember? You don't remember who was at the crime scene when you got there, ma'am? I don't know any of the detectives. Ma'am, were there people wearing suits who weren't in uniform inside the, crime, inside the yellow evidence tape when you arrived at the Bundy crime scene? Yes. There are several people who weren't wearing uniforms inside that tape. Sustained. Were there more than five people not wearing uniforms inside that tape? I don't remember. And there were people from the coroner's office inside that tape when you arrived at the scene, weren't there? Yes. And ma'am, isn't it fair to say that you cannot assume that no one altered the crime scene before you arrived? Isn't that correct? That's correct. And isn't it correct, ma'am, that the reason that they asked you to investigate whether the crime scene had been altered is because they don't want you to assume it hadn't been. Isn't that correct? We do not investigate who has been in the crime scene area. Ma'am, are you, are you required to investigate whether the crime scene has been altered? What do you mean by investigate? Are you required to make a determination as to whether the crime scene has been altered? Isn't that what SID wants you to do when you get to a crime scene, ma'am? We're close. What was the last question? I'm sorry. Hasn't the SID unit of the LA Police Department instructed you to make a determination when you get to the crime scene as to whether it has been altered? It's vague and overbroad as to determination. Other than knowing who arrived, I don't see how we can determine if it, the scene itself had been altered. Well, do you think that one thing you might be able to do is to simply ask a detective whether or not he or she has done anything to alter the scene? possible. What did they teach you at the SID Mini Academy that you're supposed to do to answer this important question? Has the scene been altered? If so, by whom and how? What did they teach you to do to answer that question? <coughs> Just get an idea of who had been there. Well, once you get an idea of who had been there, Ms. Mazzola, don't you have to ask the people what they did so you can make a determination in your own mind as to whether or not they did, in fact, alter it? Didn't they teach you that? Ask them what? When the first officers arrive on the scene, they are looking at the victims. They're not going to remember exactly where they stepped. I don't know what you are asking. Ms. Mazzola, did they teach you at the SID Mini Academy that you were to ask the detectives whether or not they moved any articles of evidence, for starters? Did they teach you that? No. They didn't teach you that. Did they teach you that, to ask the officers who were there, or detectives who were there, whether they walked into a critical area where there may be shoe prints? Did they teach you that? I don't believe 
they went into depth in that with that question. Did they teach you to ask the detectives whether they brought any foreign matter into the crime scene, such as a blanket? Did they no. teach you that? No. So you t correct me if I'm mistaken, Ms. Mazzola. So your testimony that you received absolutely no training on how to answer that question, that is, has the scene been altered? If so, by whom and how? Is that a fair statement, that you really didn't receive any training on how to answer those questions at a crime scene? Yes. Now, on June 13th, Ms. Mazzola, you started out by going to Rockingham, right? Correct. Then you went to Bundy. Right. Then you went back to Mr. Simpson's house at Rockingham, is that right? That's correct. Then you returned to the laboratory. Correct. And on the morning of June 14th, you were in the laboratory processing samples, is that right? Let's see, on the morning of the 14th. When you first arrived. I was working, filling out property reports for a car search we had done previously. You didn't do any processing of samples on the 14th? Not in the morning, no. And um, you then went out and you went to the Bronco on the 14th? Correct. And is the reason you went out with Dennis Fung on the 14th to the Bronco because it's a standard LA Police Department SID procedure that once a criminalist becomes involved in the case, he or she continues with the case and subsequent uh, searches and investigations? For the most part, yes. For the most part, there are exceptions to that? If you are absolutely unable to get away, if you had to go to court or something like that, another criminalist would step in. Okay, but aside from either illness or, uh, or you have uh, responsibilities testifying in court, it's the standard procedure at LAPD that once a criminalist is, is, is assigned to a case that he or she sticks with it for each of these searches. And is that is that correct? For the most part, yes. And that's why you went back on the 14th to the Bronco with Dennis Fung? Correct. But in this case, ma'am, you didn't stick with this case beyond the 14th, did you? That's correct. Well, I take that back. We did go for the Bentley. And what day was that? Um, may I check my... Please. Uh, I was on the 30th. On June 28th, you did not participate in the uh, search of the Bronco, did you? No. And on June 28th, you did not participate with Dennis Fung in the search of Mr. Simpson's home, did you? No. On each of those occasions, to your knowledge, Mr. Fung had another uh, team member, right? No. If you know. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. And on July 3rd, when Mr. Fung went back out to Bundy on a crime scene uh, investigation, you didn't go with him on that, that occasion either? No. To your knowledge, Ms. Mazzola, was it Dennis Fung's decision that you be replaced on this crime, on this case? Sustained. Well, Ms. Mazzola, on June 28th, were you out sick? I don't believe so. On June 28th, were you in court testifying? I don't believe so. On July 3rd, were you out sick? I don't believe so. On July 3rd, were you in court testifying? I don't believe so. Do you know, well, who made the decision, Ms. Mazzola, to your knowledge, that you should not go out with Dennis Fong on those subsequent searches in connection with this case? Sustained. Some facts not in evidence. Rephrase the question. Well, Ms. Mazzola, you were no longer his team member on those June 28th and July 3rd investigations, is that correct? Sustained. Assumes facts that aren't in evidence, counsel. You weren't present with Dennis Fung on either of those occasions, were you? No. And you're on a subject to connection. There's already been testimony about investigations done Wait. on those dates. Wait. I ask your next Sorry. question. <laughs> Had you been told by anyone at SID 
that you would not be accompanying Mr. Fung on June 28th for those investigations in connection with this case? No. Had you been told by anyone that you would be not at SID that you would not be accompanying Dennis Fung on the July 3rd investigation in connection with this case? No. Come on. Well, Ms. Mazzola, to your knowledge, was there a decision made by anybody at SID to replace you on this case? Still <laughs> I have no knowledge about that. Now, let's just jump ahead a second to the uh, June 14th search you did of the uh, of the Bronco at the print shed, okay? Okay. And I believe you mentioned that you did what's known as a phenothaline test on the accelerator, the brake pedal, and the emergency brake pad, is that correct? That's correct. And when you did those three tests, did you place a, a single swab of cotton on each of those three items? Is that what you did? I was told just to use one swab and test all three. I'm sorry, what? I was told to use one swab and test all three. Did you use one swab for all three? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Just, okay, so in other words, you use the same swab on the accelerator, the brake pad, and the uh, emergency brake. Is that right? That's correct. Who was it who told you that you should use the same swab to do a presumptive test for blood on three separate items? Mr. Fung. Prior to your going out there on June 14th, had you received any instruction or training on the use of the phenothaline test? Yes. And when you received that training, Ms. Mazzola, didn't they tell you that you should use separate swabs on separate items? Yes. Well, when Mr. Fung, your supervisor that day on June 14th, told you to use the same single swab on three different items to test for the presence of blood, did you say to him, Mr. Fung, Dennis, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing? Did you say that? No. He was your supervisor that day, is that right? Yes. And so you just followed his directions, is that right? Yes. And is the reason you followed his directions that day, Ms. Mazzola, because you didn't want to rock the boat? Overruled. I wouldn't call it rocking the boat. Well, Ms. Mazzola, this was a relatively new job for you, correct? Yes. You'd only been there since January of 1994. Correct. Would it be fair to say you didn't want to lose that job? That would not make me lose my job. Ms. Mazzola, I asked you a question. Would it be fair to say you didn't want to lose that job? Yeah, that's fair. Oh, If I had questioned Mr. Fung, that would not be cause for me to lose my job. Ms. Mazzola, it would be fair to say you didn't want to lose that job at that point. Yeah, that's Overruled. You can answer the question. Okay. She still has the job, and it's much later. <laughs> I, assume I didn't, didn't right. I did not want to lose the job, and that would not make me lose You were on it. probation at that time, weren't you, Ms. Mazzola? Yes. And the critical comments of supervisors could have an impact on whether or not you would pass that probation. Is that correct? To some extent, yes. And Ms. Mazzola, when you looked at those three items, the accelerator, the brake pad, and the emergency brake pedal, you did not observe any red stains on them. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And the purpose of this phenothaline test, Ms. Mazzola, is to learn whether there could be blood present. Isn't that right? That's correct. In fact, there were stains that you tested on June 13th, um, which weren't even red. Isn't that correct? I'm sorry. If, I see from a furrowed brow that it was an unclear question. I'll right. refer it. Um, would you agree, ma'am, that some of the stains that you examined on June 13th at Rockingham, for instance, um, weren't red stains, but nevertheless, you did a phenothaline test? 
I can't remember. Well, you did do some tests at Rockingham, which were negative, correct? Correct. For instance, you looked at stains in the family room at Mr. Simpson's house, correct? Correct. You did a phenolphthalein test there, and they were negative, correct? Correct. And you saw stains on the garage at Mr. Simpson's house, correct? On the garage. I don't remember those. Would it refresh your recollection if you were to look at your notes, your field notes from yes. that day? Uh, yes, do you mean the um, door leading out to the garage? Well, I'm just asking you whether it's the garage. If it was well, the door leading out, that's, if that's your recollection, okay. that's your that's recollection. That's correct. Wait, that was negative. Wait, both of you can't talk at the same time. Okay. Let me ask the question again. Did you also do a phenolphthalein test on some portion of the garage? Correct. And it was negative? Correct. Now, when you get a negative result on a phenolphthalein test, that's conclusive, isn't it? Yes. And when I say it's conclusive, does it mean to you, and you've been taught, that it can't possibly be blood if it's negative? Correct. However, a positive result, when that, when that little swab turns that, uh, I think you said magenta? Magenta pink, yes. OK. Turns that magenta pink color. It's not a definitive result, isn't that right? That's correct. And in fact, all it means is, is that the stain could possibly be blood, right? Right. And the test that you do, this phenolphthalein test, it certainly isn't a test for human blood, isn't that right? That's correct. And in your training at, this, um, at SID, um, did you learn, in fact, that there are many other substances other than blood, which can also give you that magenta color, uh, which are in blood? Yes. And were you taught, ma'am, that some of them are the juices from common vegetables and fruits? Yes. And were you also taught, ma'am, that even bacteria, germs, OK, that are invisible to the human eye can also give a false positive when you do the phenolphthalein test? I was not told about the germs, no. We told about bacteria? No. We told about microorganisms? No. Well, you were taught how to do this test at the laboratory, is that right? That's right. When they taught you how to do this test at SID, did they encourage you to read scientific literature on the subject as well? We did some reading, yes. OK. And um, was any of the reading that you did uh, peer-reviewed articles uh, in the scientific journals? I believe one article was in a journal, uh, the majority came from textbooks. And have you ever read any scientific publication which talks about or describes how bacteria, invisible to the human eye, can give a positive test for the phenolphthalein test? Subject to connection. Oh, well, have you ever read such a thing? No. Ma'am, in your training at SID, did they ever teach you to use what are called negative controls? Yes. Could you please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what a negative control is? It is using the same item, be it a swatch or a swab, that you will use to collect a stain or to run a test. You run the test on the, a brand new, a different swab. 
it should be negative since nothing has been collected on the swab. And ma'am, when you did the phenolphthalein test with the single swab on the brake pedal, the emergency brake, and the accelerator, you didn't use any negative control to see whether or not something else other than blood might be generating a false positive reaction, did you? No. And would you agree that other than the various vegetables and fruit juices and other substances that can generate a false positive, that sloppiness or carelessness on the part of a criminalist can also lead to a false positive? I don't see how. Well, let me ask you this hypothetical, Ms. Mazzola. If an inexperienced criminalist inadvertently touched an area where there is a blood stain, on the carpet on the driver's side of that Bronco, inadvertently put their hand, even with a rubber glove, on either the pedal, the accelerator, or the brake pad, couldn't that leave a substance that would give you a positive result? On the swabs we use? No. You're saying that if you touched um, moist blood on the carpet and then brought your hand to the brake pedal, the emergency brake or the accelerator, that that absolutely could not generate a false positive or a positive result. Is that your testimony? Oh, well. The swabs we use are not the normal Q-tips. They have an extremely long wooden handle. Our hands never come near the tip of the swabs. What I'm asking you, ma'am, is not whether your hand comes close to the tip of the swab, but I'm asking you if, if your hand, at some other point while you're in the Bronco, touched accidentally. Okay, if it did, it's a hypothetical, touched accidentally uh, a blood stain on the carpet, if that hand then inadvertently came into contact with the pedals while you're down there, you know, mucking about in the car, could that generate a positive result? Hypothetically, it could. Okay. Now, on June 14th, it was yours and Dennis Fung's job to collect every single blood stain on the outside and inside of the Bronco that was visible to you. Isn't that right? Uh, yes, I believe so. And each time that you set out to collect blood stains in this case, for each stain that you collected, Ms. Mazzola, weren't you instructed to collect as much of the stain as you possibly could collect? Yes. In fact, you were supposed to collect the entire visible stain. Isn't that right? I believe so, yes. And it would be, and you were taught, ma'am, to keep swatching that blood stain uh, until the blood was completely collected. Isn't that correct? To get as much up as possible, yes. And in fact, you've been taught by the laboratory that it was important to get as much up as possible uh, in the event that uh, DNA testing might be considered. I think it was also just for basic serology, not necessarily DNA. Okay. And on the morning of the 14th, you arrived at the uh, print shed around 10.30? Uh, may I check my notes? Please. please. I'm sorry, do you have an independent recollection of what time you arrived? No. Okay, then please do. Yes. Uh, yes, it was around 10.30. And you stayed there for approximately three hours? Okay. And when you were there during those three hours, the press wasn't there to distract you, were they? Mm, we did not see them. Okay. And there was, was there a large group of detectives with you when you were at the print shed? No. So they weren't distract so the detectives weren't distracting you either that day, were they? The detectives were really not a distraction to begin with. In other words, Ms. Mazzola, when you were at the print shed on the 14th, you were able to pursue your tasks conscientiously and professionally, as best you could. Is that right? As we did on the 13th, yes. And so was Dennis Fung, correct? Yes. And during those three hours that you were at the Bronco on June 14th, you made a systematic examination of the outside of that car, didn't you? Uh, Mr. Fung and myself, yes. 
and you systematically examine the entire exterior of the bronco for even the smallest yet visible specks of blood. Isn't that right? Yes. And uh, you looked on the fenders, right? We looked at the outside. Well, the fenders are part of the well, outside, right? right? Hmm? Correct. And you looked on the doors? Correct. Top and bottom? Yes. And you pointed out to Dennis Fung every single stain that you noticed, correct? He was a little better at picking out the stains than I was. And Dennis Fung pointed out every stain that he noticed to you, didn't he? Correct. And isn't it true, Ms. Mazzola, that on June 14th, Dennis Fung never pointed out to you any dark red stains on the white metal portion of the sill on the driver's door, did he? I don't remember if he did or not. Well, Miss Mazzola, did he point out any stains to you on that car? Yes. On the exterior? Yes. You actually remember him pointing out some stains, correct? Yes. In fact, you remember him pointing out a stain outside the passenger door, isn't that right? Yes. You actually remember that independently? Yes. And as you sit here today, you have no independent recollection of Dennis Fung ever pointing out to you any small stains on the sill of the driver's door. Isn't that correct? That's correct. In fact, you would... One moment. Be a good spot, or do you need a few more questions on this line? No, we can stop at this moment. Okay. okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a uh, brief recess for the court reporter. Fifteen minutes. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Form any opinions about the case. Have any conversations with anybody about the case. Conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. We'll see you back in fifteen minutes. All right, Ms. Mazzola, you may step down. She was um, uh, filling out a report on another case. Mm -hmm. I'm asking that uh, the people be compelled to instruct her to produce that report uh, with her uh, either this afternoon or um, tomorrow morning, preferably this afternoon, um, because what she did the morning of the uh, 14th is a, is a very relevant material matter which will be coming up uh, in this course examination. The people are well aware of it. Any uh, difficulty locating the report? I, I don't know, Your Honor, because I don't know whether they can track it down per case. But I, I told counsel that, that, just generally speaking, I didn't see how that could possibly be discoverable, and therefore I would oppose it. All right, we'll have a hearing at 4.30. What? Excuse me? 4.30. Okay, but I can even tell you in 10 seconds why it's, why it's discoverable, frankly. 4.30. Okay. Let's have the jurors. Ms. Mazzola, would you resume the witness stand, please?
Let the record reflect we've now been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Ms. Mazzola is again on the witness stand undergoing cross-examination by Mr. Neufeld. Good morning again, Ms. Mazzola. Good morning. You're reminded you are still under oath, and Mr. Neufeld, you may continue. When we left off, Ms. Mazzola, you said that uh, you had no present recollection of ever being shown any smears or red stains uh, in the sill area of the driver's side of the uh, Bronco door. Is that correct? Yes. And um, <clears throat> you had been taught, uh, Ms. Mazzola, that if you had seen uh, smears or, or stains, that uh, you should photograph them. Isn't that correct? Yes. And you had been taught. Um, <clears throat> one, one, one moment. Certainly. Show you what's been offered as um, defendant's 1097. Please. Equals 197. Actually, I don't think that. Photograph has any markings on it, so it's not, it doesn't appear to be the court's exhibit. All right. In fact, it may not be 10 97, I'm not positive. It is. All right, I'll accept Mr. Harris's representation that it's 1097. Ms. Mazzola, just so there's no misunderstanding, um, when I talk about the white sill area on the driver's door, I'm referring to, um, well, did you, I'm sorry, you, did you know when I asked you those questions that I was referring to that white strip of metal, um, which is uh, under and next to uh, the, the, the driver's door? I had an that idea, picture? that's what you You did have an idea, yes. okay. In fact, during your prep excuse session me. with the district excuse attorney, me. excuse me, Ms. Mazzola, please I let him finish answering the asking the question before you start to answer. The court reporter can only write down one person at a time. All right, thank you. In Proceed. fact, during your prep sessions with the prosecutors, did they tell you that the issue of whether or not there were um, blood stains located on the sill area was an issue in the case? Did that it, come up at all during your prep it sessions? It came up. Yes. Okay. Hmm. And um, one moment. I need. In fact, Ms. Mazzola, the um, the only stains or smears that you saw anywhere on the exterior of the car um, on the 14th was um, a couple of tiny specks on the passenger door, isn't that correct? On the exterior passenger door. From independent recollection, yes. Well. Uh, next in order would be? Defense. 1113. Thank you. I'll show you, that is 1113.
Is that picture familiar to you? You recognize it? Yes. And what is it a picture? I'm sorry. Is that a photograph um, of what is item 20 in this case that you referred to on direct examination? Let me make sure that's the right. Okay. Yes, it is item 20. And that's on the passenger side, correct? The opposite Cor side? Correct. Okay. Now, um, you said you had been taught that uh, if you had seen other stains or smears on the exterior of the car, that uh, you had been taught that they too would have been photographed, correct? Yes. And you had also been taught, man, that if you saw um, stains that could possibly be blood, that you were, you were also instructed to swatch them. Is that correct? And bring them back to the laboratory. If they were phenol positive, yes, we would collect them. Okay, so you were instructed then to do a pheno test as well on stains. If there was any question, yes. All right. And um, obviously no pheno test was done on any portion of the driver's sill on the 14th. Isn't that right? I honestly don't remember. Well, did you... Well, let me ask you this. If a pheno test was done, would it be recorded in your notes? Yes. Okay. Would you please look at your notes to see whether or not any pheno test was done on the sill of the driver's door to the Bronco? No, one was not done. Excuse me? One was not done. Okay. Now I show you what is already in evidence as People's 197A. See that? Yes. Or <laughs> world. Record to reflect that, that she is being shown this matter, however, however, on the Elmo. Do you want to show her the printout? Sure. Let me um, show you another copy. This is 197B. prosecution's exhibit. Take a look at this as well. And does 197B appear to be the same image as appears on the Elmo, only a little bit better resolution? Mm, it appears so, yes. Okay. Now, do you see the specks that are circled in that picture? There are three circles? Yes. And those specks that are circled, ma'am, they could simply be dirt, couldn't they? It's possible. Well, they're not red, are they? Uh, from this photo, it's hard to tell. Well, in that photograph, do they appear to be red to you, ma'am? They actually look more brown. Now, let me ask you a hypothetical, Ms. Mazzola. You actually have seen the car, right? You've been out there? Yes. You've seen the car when the door was opened on the driver's side when the door was closed? Yes. Here's the hypothetical. If Detective Furman said that he saw four brush marks on the lower area of the driver's door. Now, what I want you to assume for this hypothetical, Ms. Mazzola, is that these four marks that are circled in that picture are the same four marks that Detective Furman claims he saw. Would Detective Furman have had to open the driver's door to see at least two of those four marks? It's sustained. It's argumentative. All right. Well, Ma'am, you see the location of the various specks that are circled in that photograph? Yes. To see the two specks on the upper circle, you see where the two circles are? Yes. Would the door, the driver's door, have to be in the open position to see those two specks? Well, 
Overruled. Overruled. You can answer that question. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it would have to be open or closed. Next in order is uh, eleven fourteen. All right, defense eleven fourteen. I'm going to show you as you walk at defense exhibit eleven fourteen. And where's the duplicate? Here's to be a photograph of the Morocco. And I will show you. Driver's side. And I, a duplicate copy of the same photograph. Here you go. So you can see it close up. You have a chance to look at them both. If there's one more time, just tell okay. me. Okay, a little bit more time. Okay. All right, Ms. Mazzola, have you had enough time to look at that? Yes, I have. All right, do you need a magnifying glass or anything like that? Mm, no. All right, proceed. Have you had an opportunity to look at the uh, photograph of the, uh, of the Bronco? Yes. And that is a photograph of the Bronco at the print shed, ma'am? Yes, it is. And that's the way it appeared on, uh, on June 14th? Yes. And, uh, ma'am, now that you've had a chance to look at that photograph of the Bronco, I now ask you once again... Actually, can you Having looked at that photograph, and now also, once again, looking at um, 1097. You see that on the monitor? Yes.
Would you agree, ma'am, that if the, um, you seen that not long enough? Yes. Okay. Now would you agree that in order to see the specs that are in the upper of the two circles, see the two circles yes. on top of each other, that in order to see those two specs, the door would have to be in the open position. Sustain. We phrase the question. Foundation. Mm -hmm. When you went out to the scene on the 14th, you um, systematically examined the Bronco exterior, did you not? Overrule as to scene, do you mean the print shed? At the print shed. Right? Uh, yes. Well, in fact, that's what your, your vehicle search inspection list requires you to do, to make a systematic examination of the exterior of the car. Isn't that right? Yes, it does. And you did that? Mr. With Bunn Dennis and myself. Fong. Correct. All right. And you examined the uh, door of the car, correct? Yes. And you examined it both in the closed position and the open position, correct? Yes. And based on now what you examined that day in the open position and closed position of the door, and uh, having looked at these photographs, would you agree that in order to see the specs in the upper circle, that the door would have to be in the open position? Oh. It's hard to say. I'm not sure how far the bottom of the Bronco flares out. From the pictures, it, I can't say if it would have to be open or closed. Ma'am, in the pictures that you have in front of you, doesn't the door of the Bronco come down <coughs> flush with the outer edge of that sill? In the pictures that you have. I'm not sure if it's flush or not. There's a bottom strip that could be out a little further. In the picture, it's a little hard to tell. By the way, Mr. Zola, though, to the oh, this myself? okay. To the best of your recollection, ma'am, you didn't even see the <coughs> specs in that upper circle on the 14th, did you? To the best of my recollection, I did not. And you did not see the spec in the lower circle, did you? No. And you did not see the smear or or grayish or I'm sorry, discoloration indicated in the third circle, did you? No. You didn't see any of those on the 14th, did you? To the best of my recollection, I did not. Right. Ms. Mazzola, you didn't see them in the morning of the 13th either, did you? I wasn't. What was the fact that she was? The world. <coughs> On the 13th, I don't believe I was looking that carefully. Ms. Mazzola, you were shown the car on the 13th by the detectives, didn't you? Weren't you? Yes. And you walked over with the detectives and Dennis Fung to examine the Bronco, didn't you? Yes. And in fact, I think you said that you personally even uh, swatched the stain on the handle of the Bronco, didn't you? Yes. And that stain was pointed out to you by uh, Detective Furman, wasn't it? I'm not sure which one pointed it out. Well, you were there when Detective Furman pointed it out to, well, I'm sorry, withdrawing. You were at the Bronco with Dennis Fung and other detectives when one of the detectives pointed out a, a small speck near the handle in the driver's door, isn't that correct? That's correct. And at that point in time, when that speck was pointed out to you and Dennis Fung, no other speck was pointed out to you and Dennis Fung on the exterior of the car. Isn't that correct? I don't remember. I just remember the one on the driver's handle. Well, with respect to your independent recollection, Ms. Mazzola, as it stands today, is it fair to say that you have no independent recollection of any detective showing you any other speck 
for stain on that car other than the speck next to the driver's handle? That I can recall. That's no. what I'm asking you. Your independent recollection. Would My you independent recall? recollection, no. Thank you. By the way, Ms. Mazzola, when you do a phenothaline test, <clears throat> have you been taught that there are confirmatory tests that you can do back at the laboratory? That is why we collect the positive stains. And the reason, I'm sorry, and the confirmatory test that can be done back in the laboratory would tell you whether or not it was in fact blood as opposed to some other substance which created a false positive. Isn't that correct? I am not in the serology section. I, I don't know. Well, I'm not asking you for what test is done. I'm asking you whether or not you were told that there are tests <coughs> that are done back at the serology laboratory to confirm whether or not an item which you suspected might be blood was in fact blood as opposed to something else. It's possible, yes. And um, there are also confirmatory tests that you've been taught about which can tell you whether something is human blood as opposed to some animal blood. Isn't that right? I have heard of those tests, yes. And as you sit here today, ma'am, referring to those specs that you collected, which are item 20 on the passenger door? Yes. To your knowledge, has there ever been any confirmatory test done to determine whether or not that speck on the door was human blood? It's well, it's a stain. It's it's a vague question. Which you're you're referring to item 20 in photograph uh, number uh, defendant's 1113, correct? Yes, I am. All right. Do you understand the question, Ms. Mazzola? Item 20, the three specs on the passenger door. Is that what he's referring to? Right. I'm, what I'm asking you is with respect to the specs on the door. Okay. okay. Item 20. Right. As you sit here today. Me, counsel, you keep on saying specs, and Mr. Harris put up another photograph. We're talking about 1113 passenger door specs 20, correct? Yes. All right, proceed. Okay. With respect to those, those two specs that you see in the picture to the left of the number 20, to your knowledge, has there ever been a confirmatory test to determine whether or not those specs are human blood? Or rule, do you know if they, uh, they were tested? I do not know if they were tested. Okay. When the detectives showed you the speck the morning of the 13th on the driver's door, not number 20, but the speck on the driver's door, that was right after Dennis Fung and the detectives had this discussion. Is that correct? Yes. And was Dennis Fung with you when the detectives pointed out the speck on the driver's door? Whole world. Yes. Okay. Now, at both Rockingham and Bundy, did the detectives tell you which items to collect? They showed us different items and between talking with Mr. Fung, they all decided which ones should be collected as evidence. Dennis Fung and the detectives decided? Correct. One second, Your
during your uh, training at the SID Mini Academy, um, did you receive handouts from time to time on how to conduct crime scene investigations? We received various handouts, yes. Okay. SSB mark next in order. 1115, Defense 1115. <laughs> show you what's been marked as Defendant's 1115. I ask you to take a look at it. Read it to yourself. Was that handout, I'm sorry, was that document one of the handouts that you were given at the LAPD? I honestly can't remember if it was or not. And seeing it doesn't refresh your recollection no. as whether it was? No. In your presence, did Dennis Fung, outside the presence of the detectives, ever independently go out and look for evidence? Not in my presence, I don't think. When you arrived at Bundy that day, did the detectives make you wait until they removed both bodies. I waited back on the sidewalk. Mr. Fung did not. Well, did you wait back on the sidewalk because the detectives had asked you to wait? No. Well, had the detectives asked you to wait before you began your own work until the bodies had been both removed? They did not ask me personally, no. Well, did they ask Dennis Fung in your presence? No. Well, had you been taught, Ms. Mazzola, that when you first get to a crime scene, you are to make a quick search for perishable evidence? Is that something you've been taught at SID? Yes. And as you stood there when you arrived, you saw that the <coughs> coroners were in the process of moving bodies. Were you not? Yes. Did you, when you first arrived, go forward then into the crime scene to conduct a quick search for perishable evidence? I did not personally know. And why is it that you didn't do that, Ms. Mazzola? Because Mr. Fung was up in the area. Well, did you actually, from where you were, standing on the sidewalk, you could observe Mr. Fung, couldn't you? For the most part, yes. And when you saw Mr. Fung go into the area, he was carrying the brown paper bag which had the glove in it, didn't he? I don't believe he had it the first time he went up. All right, the first time he went up, did you see Dennis Fung making, a, making an examination for perishable or easily movable evidence? I don't remember seeing him. You don't remember seeing him do that, do you? No, I don't remember seeing him. Well, you don't remember seeing him at all? I saw him up in the scene. I do not remember exactly what he was doing. Well, where in the scene was he when you saw him? At what point, Counselor? When you were standing out on the sidewalk and they were moving the bodies, um, what did you see, or where did you see uh, Dennis Fung standing? Up in the area where they were removing the bodies. Was he on the sidewalk or was he on the steps? I can't remember. And do you have any idea what he was doing when he was in there? No. Well, now that you've done that examination, okay, of that crime scene that day, you do know that he wasn't 
removing perishable or other small items near the bodies. Is that correct? No foundation for personal knowledge. Oral. Do you understand I, the question? I, I believe so. Right, go ahead and answer. I do not believe that he was removing any <coughs> perishable items at that time. Nor was he removing any small items that were in close proximity to the bodies, was he? No, he did not appear to be, no. Did you say to Dennis Fong, before he walked into the crime scene, that we should quickly look for perishable and other small items since they're moving the bodies? No. <clears throat> did Dennis Fung say something to that effect in your presence to the detectives? In my presence, I do not believe so, no. <clears throat> and you would agree that trace evidence can be transferred carelessly when bodies are moved? It is possible, yes. Well, you were taught that, weren't you? Yes. In your presence, did you ever hear Dennis Fung, your supervisor, tell the detectives not to move the bodies until he first made an inspection of the scene for perishable or other small items? In my presence, no. Now, at 7 a.m., you said when, that's when you arrived, a little bit after 7 a.m., you arrived at Rockingham with Dennis Fung? I uh, may check my notes. Sure. You don't have an independent recollection as to what time you arrived? Not independent recollection, no. Okay. It was approximately around 7 a.m., yes. And you said that you overheard the discussion that Dennis Fung had with the detectives at that time, is that right? Bits and pieces, yes. Right. And the detectives showed you around the grounds before you began collecting any stains, isn't that correct? Yes. And at that point, the detectives told you which items to collect. Isn't that right? They sh pointed out items that they were interested in. Well, when they pointed out items that they were interested in, they were telling you that the items that they were interested in are the items that you and Dennis Funk should collect. Isn't that right? Those and others, if we found any, yes. Well, did you find other items out there in the driveway of Mr. Simpson's house other than what was pointed out to you by the detectives? In the driveway, no. And so as to the items in the driveway, the detectives told you which items to collect? Yes. But you didn't even bother collecting any of the stains uh, until 8.15, isn't that right? Sustained. Oh, sorry, you didn't collect any of the stains until at least 8.15, is that right? May I check the time? Sure. The stain on the Bronco was collected at approximately 8.15. Okay. And that was the first stain to be collected? Yes, it was. And the stains on the driveway were collected after that, right? Yes. Okay. And <clears throat> Ms. Mazzola, did you at any time after, the, dis after uh, the discussion was over between Dennis Fung and the detectives say to the detectives, wait, we should go to Bundy first and examine that scene before they move the bodies? I did not know. Did Dennis Fung say something to that effect in your presence to these detectives? Not in my presence, no. Now, what about, and that, that conversation would be around 7.30 in the morning, is that right? Maybe a little before. A little before 7.30, maybe 7.20. Somewhere between the time we arrived and we started collecting. Okay, so you didn't say anything to the detectives about the necessity of going to Bundy before they moved the bodies at 7.20 or 7.30 in the morning, is that right? Sustain, phrase the question or move on. Well, let's see, what about at 8 a.m.? At 8 a.m., you still hadn't collected the uh, 
first stain, you knew at that point in time that there were bodies at Bundy that would have to be moved, did you not? Argument calls for speculation, too. Well, had you been told prior to 8 a.m. that there were bodies in connection with this homicide case at Bundy? Oh, well. I knew that there were bodies at Bundy. And you knew from your experience and training that the coroner's office would be there to move those bodies, did you not? I did not. Oh, well. I did not know if the coroners would be there or not. Well, you knew that at some point in time the coroners would come to the scene to remove the two victims, did you not? At some point, yes. All right. Did you ask the detectives whether or not the bodies had been removed yet at 8 a.m. in the morning before you started collecting stains at Rockingham? No. Did Mr. Fung ask the detectives that in your presence? Not in my presence. Now, after you collected the drop on the Bronco, it, was still, it wasn't until 9 o'clock that you began picking up the other drops in the driveway. Is that right? May I check the notes? Please do. Yes, approximately 9 a.m. Okay. So at this point, you'd already been at the scene, ma'am, an hour and a half approximately. Is that right? Not quite an hour and a half. And you knew that bodies, there were two bodies of two victims at the Bundy location, correct? Yes, there were two victims at Bundy. And you knew that, just from your experience, that at some point in time, coroners would have to move those two bodies, correct? Yes, they would have to remove them. And you'd also been taught, had you not, Ms. Mazzola, in terms of crime scene evidence collection methods, that it is preferable to examine the crime scene before bodies are removed for small items or perishable items. Had you been taught that? Um, small and perishable. Ha haven't we gone through this already? We have. I'm just trying to say we have. Three we have. Let's proceed. Okay. <coughs> now, at both Rockingham and Bundy, photographs were taken of the various blood stains. Is that right? That's correct. And for many of those uh, photographs, were the photo cards set up by Dennis Fung? Yes. And in the photographs that were set up by Dennis Fung, one moment, can I help you? Um, he did not place a ruler uh, in the, in the uh, scene, did he? I don't remember if he did or not. Your Honor, with the Which board is this? I'm sorry, what? Which board is this? Oh. Um, this is People's uh, 120. Thank you. All right. With the court's permission, may the witness step down? Yes. What happened to our pointer there? Ah, there we go. Ma'am, in your um, training, at SID, were you taught that when you take a photograph of a blood stain um, or other item of evidence, that you should use a ruler in the photograph? Is that something you were taught? No. Well, did you receive a handout which described how photographs should be taken at crime scenes? Take us to photographs. Oh, really? I believe we did, yes.
be marked for the application next time. Eleven sixteen. Sixteen one six. Thank you. Show you has been marked. Oh, sorry. Show you has been marked as defendants eleven sixteen. Ask you to take a look at those two pages. The handout you received on forensic photography. I don't know if it's the exact handout that we received. Could be. It's possible. Well, it calls for speculation. Hold. You say could be. Could be, could not be. But you say you recall receiving a handout on forensic photography, did you not? Yeah. Were you taught at the SID, Ms. Mazzola, that Acceptable crime scene photography should tell a story by itself, absent of any written or oral narration. You taught that concept. Something like that, yes. And when you taught Ms. Mazzola at SID that the photograph should have some scale in it so a person who's looking at the photograph will know how big the object is. It's vague as to what type of photograph. Overall. Who you taught that? I don't remember if you were or not. Well, Ms. Mazzola, let me, just for a second, look at what is, what is here in this picture, um, photograph B on Prosecution's Exhibit 120. You see it? Yes. And you see a red stain in the picture? Yes. And would you agree, ma'am, that if there was no ruler in that picture, you would have, a viewer would have no idea how large that stain is? Would you agree? Yes. And isn't it true that because of that fact, you were taught at SID that it is important to put some kind of scale or ruler in a photograph so when someone looks at the photograph, they will have an idea as to how large the stain is? That is a possibility to have a ruler in the scene. I'm not asking you whether it's a possibility, ma'am. I'm asking you whether or not your instructors at the Los Angeles Police Department Scientific Investigation Division taught you that for forensic photography, that you should put or, or instruct the photographer to put a ruler in the picture when you take a picture of a blood stain so that anyone else who's looking at it will know how big the stain is. I don't believe they told us that. The forensic photographers know how to photograph evidence. It's up to them. Ms. Mazzola, isn't the job of the criminal is to instruct and direct the forensic photographer at the scene? Isn't that one of your responsibilities? It is the supervising criminalist's Fine. So it's Dennis Fung's responsibility. Is that what you're saying? To instruct the forensic photographer how to take the pictures at the scene? Excuse me, counsel, if you would. She was mid-answer when you started asking the next question. Allow her. I apologize, Your Honor. Thank you. Would you please repeat? So would it be fair to say that it was Dennis Fung's responsibility as the senior criminalist at the scene to instruct the forensic photographers on how to take the pictures of various items of evidence? Not as to how, but which items he wanted photographed. Isn't it, weren't you instructed, Ms. Mazzola, to make sure there is comprehensive coverage of each item of evidence at the crime scene? And weren't you instructed, ma'am, to make sure that the forensic photographer takes close-up shots as well as distant shots of each item of evidence? Photographers are trained to... I... I'm sorry. I ask whether you were instructed to make sure that that happens. You being a criminalist. We were given information on the way the forensic photographers photograph crime scenes. Ma'am, who brings the numbers that are put down 
to uh, identify different items for the photographer to take pictures of. We do. That's your job, the criminalist, right? Right. You set the item numbers down. Correct. And if you want the photographer, by the way, were you working with one photographer at Rockingham uh, in the morning um, of July, of June 13th? I believe we were, I cannot be asked. There was the same photographer who at least shot the different stains in the driveway with you, isn't that right? Yes. And it was Dennis Fung's job to instruct that photographer um, what he wanted in the photograph, wasn't it? Sustain. Yes. And you Excuse said, me. ma'am. Excuse me. Sustain. I didn't really ask the question. I understand yeah. that. I'm just advising the witness okay. if I sustain the objection. Thank you. And Excuse you me. said, I believe. Excuse me, Mr. Newfeld, is there a reason we. Are you still questioning as to. Now I'm going to question about the board. All right. Okay. And I believe you said on direct examination that Dennis Fung was not with you when you collected item 7 and item 8 at Rockingham. Isn't that right? That's correct. And he was with you when items 4, 5, and 6 were collected. Isn't that right? Yes. And item 4 is shown Sorry, in photograph A, correct? Yes. And item five and six is shown in photograph C, correct? Correct. Now, for items five and six, is there a ruler in the photograph? No. Did Dennis Fung instruct the photographer to place a ruler in the photograph? Calls for speculation. In your presence? Yes. 